Okay. Um, it was Rosh Chodesh Av, the first month of Av, which is actually the day of, um, it's the yard site of Aharon, uh, the brother of Moshe. Um, he's one of the few people that we actually have the day that they passed away in the Torah, uh, which this day was the first of the fifth month, which is the month that we started. So actually yesterday was his year time. And this week um, we are starting to read a new book. Last week we finished the uh, book And now we're starting to read the book of Dvarim. And today I will try to do some kind of connection between Aaron uh, and the Book of Tvarim and also a, a bit about Isha Be'av since it's happening next week and we won't have a class next, next week. So I'm trying to combine everything together. Um, so the Ramban is saying that the book of Tvarim has a specific goal. This book is actually not very long and the book is the speech of Moshe to Am Israel before he passed away. And according to the Ramban, the goal of this book is to try to create some of, um, to make the Torah that was learned in the, in the desert, to make it fit to the Torah that I'm supposed to do in Eretz Israel. Because it's a different thing to, to receive Torah and to live it while you're in the desert. And it's a different thing while you live in, in, in your land. It, it, you have a different, uh, different way um, to, to, to have or to live this Torah. And this is the goal of the speech that Moshe is giving of this book that we're starting to read. And if you read this book very, very fast, just reading it without... Um, uh, top and try to read the uh, commentator or so the midrash. It's very very easy to see that this is the goal of the, of the book. For example, we have new mitzvot. We're talking about um, what's going to happen in Eretz Israel itself. For example, if you're going out to a war, a uh, different uh, mitzvot related to a war because I'm searching for the land. Or, or another example, we have um, different. Um, um, situation, for example, during this book, we have this um, Ahmad, this uh, moment when on the of mountain, mountain Eval, and actually receiving blessings and the curses. So there are different things who prepare well to prepare this way. And I would say that its books, its whole goal is to prepare them to enter Eretz Israel. It's a bit complicated because the person who's talking and the person who's preparing Am Israel to enter Eretz Israel will not be himself. We know that Moshe um, is preparing them. He's talking to them, and he's supposed to describe to Am Israel how it's going to happen and how when they will be in Eretz Israel. But he himself won't be there. So. How is it influencing the book, the fact that the one who's giving me the speech of Israel is not actually going to be there? Maybe you can say that Moshe, you know, he's professional. He's doing his job for a long time. It won't influence the book itself. It won't influence his speech because he knows how, uh, how to do it in a, in a good way. Um, but I would say... It's very clear that it, it, this fact that he's not coming into Eretz Israel does in fact infect his speech. He's not talk, talking to Israel as a neutral person who has no connection to the topic. But the whole book, when you read it, you can actually feel and breathe the fact that Moshe is saying, you will enter and I'm not. And the question is, Moshe is doing it. Why? Um, he's the one who's giving us his speech and giving us this feeling that you will be there and I won't. Uh, I would say Hebrew, like he's trying to, to make us feel bad about it, to feel sorry for him. Um, what's this fact that he's not coming in? What is trying to, to, to put it in any moment in this book? So I would be happy if you can open your microphones and tell me why do you think that Moshe is, it's very important for him to make it clear for us that we're really getting inside of Israel and he isn't. What he's trying to teach us from this message. So, 
please. I think it's a, a more like setting expectations that uh, like, you know, when a parent uh, packs his child to a summer camp, now it's the summer camp type in Israel. So, you know, he tells his kid that, you know, these are the things, these are the clothes and these are the things and I'm not going with you. You will be alone. I'll wait for you at home. You'll be fine. This is my number, but I'm not going with you. This is your summer camp. And uh, in a way, this is what uh, Moshe is doing. He's saying, uh, I'm, I'm not going. This, uh, this is your stuff. These are uh, the things. And uh, go enjoy yourself. Okay. Dalia, do you have another thought? Maybe why Moshe is putting it in every moment of the book, the reason behind it? No, I think that could be the reason. <laughs> Okay, so another explanation that uh, I heard was maybe um, he's trying to tell them you need to understand that I won't be there. So if you have, I, I think it's a bit similar to what Elena said, if you want to ask me the things that you don't understand, or I'll repeat now a bit about what happened before, or the Torah that you received before, if you don't understand, if you have questions, this is the moment to ask, because you need those, but it won't be me. And if you have things that are not solved for you or, or you need me to, to tell you, you need to understand, I'm not going to be there. And you, you need to solve it. Um, but another um, to us, and this is what I want us to talk today, is Moshe is trying to give us a feeling that the understanding that living in Eretz Israel and actually be it and, and the ability to enter it and, and be there is not something that is, is like obvious or that you can take as granted because Moshe have it and maybe I'm glad right now when they're standing inside the desert and they're not there yet it's very easy for them to agree with him they know right now they know that it would be completely different. So they understand it's not granted, they understand it's not obvious, because they are experiencing something else. And when he's talking with them, he's saying, I know that in the generation, I can see in my eyes um, that this will look different. And I brought here, um, at the Pasu is telling them, uh, do you see the screen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Dalia. Um, yes, yes. Thank you. We can you. even write. You know that we can write on your screen? This is so cool. Inside the text? That's amazing. Um, okay. No, so I'm serious. I can highlight. So, yeah. <laughs> what? We don't see it, though. Ah, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Are you from the, I raised it. It's, are you from the phone? No. no. Ah, okay. From the phone, you can do it. So cool. I'm sorry. Very cool. Okay. <laughs> so, um, in the end of the book, he's telling you on this. I'm reading in Hebrew and then in English. מין שרציביתי אתכם, וקראת אתכם הרעה באחרית הימים, כי תעשו את הרע בעיני השם להכעיסו במעשה ידיכם. Now I'm reading the English. All right, that when I am dead, you will act wickedly and turn away from the path that I enjoyed upon you, and that in time to come, misfortune fall you for having done evil in the sight of the Lord, and vex him by your deeds. So Moshe is saying, I know maybe now when you're in the desert with me, it's very, very easy for you to understand that living in Eretz Israel is something special. But he understands a few generations after, people will get used to, you know, you get used to everything. And after a few generations, they will forget what was before. It will look obvious. And the problem is that in artistically, it's very, very bad to be used to things. Because I would say what's special about that is that the land itself 
is living. And our life in Israel, in this land, is depends on Hashem. Um, if we will behave bad, Hashem will punish us and will not have rain or at a certain point we will be exiled. And if we will be behave, then the land will prosper and will have blessing. So the problem is, if we will get used to the fact that we're living in Eretz Israel, it will look obvious to us, then at a certain we'll start doing bad things and then we'll be punished. So Moshe is trying to tell them, I'm not, I'm not coming inside, I'm not getting into the land, but you do. And you understand that this is a special privilege and you need to remember it. And, and this is what he's trying to, to give them the feeling, do not forget how special it is during the whole. Um, I brought here a, a story from the Gemara in Bavli, Maktubot, who is talking about uh, Rabbi Zera. And Rabbi Zera was, um, he, he used to live in Bavel, and he decided that he needed to go to Eretz Israel to do Aliyah. And when he decides to do Aliyah, he is really against it, and he's telling him he shouldn't go. Um, but he's saying, I'm going. And he's getting to the Jordan River. And at this place, they're supposed to have a small ship who's bringing the people from one side to the other. But when he's coming there, uh, he sees that this ferry already left. And this, let's say, once a day. So he couldn't basically cross the river. And I want us to read together in Bavli what happens with Rabbi Zera, what he decides to do. To understand how this um, relates to the story of Moshe and what he's trying to, to tell us. So, when Rabbi Zera uh, ascended to Eretz Israel, he could not find a ferry to cross the Jordan River. He took hold of a rope that was strung across as a makeshift bridge and curtain. So he said, I'm not waiting for tomorrow. I'm, I'm here standing next to the Jordan. I'm crossing no matter what. So he's taking this rope and start to cross the rope. A certain Sedoki said to him, Have the people who put you, your mouth before your ears. When you said at the time of the Torah, we will do before we will hear. You remain happy to this day. Why couldn't you wait a little longer to cross the river on a ferry? So he's actually telling him, you're not thinking why you had to do this, why to risk your life to cross the river so fast. If you can wait for the ferry one more day, it's just, you know. Rabbi Zera said to him, this is a place where Moses I hurried Well, this is uh, because I have problems so I'm repeating a bit. Uh, Rabbi Zera said to him, this is a place where Moses and Aaron did not merit entering. Who is the state married seeing this land? I heard a cross before anything might occur to prevent my entrance into Eretz Israel. So Rabbi Zera, he's not being in the most, you know, uh, sensible way that you can say, ah, of course, this is what every human being will do, this makes sense. No, he's, he's just doing it because he loves it and he wants to be there. And he's saying, you know, Moshe and Aaron did it enter. I can't wait one day because who knows what will happen and then I want to enter as well. So what he's doing is an action of love. He loves Israel and we learned a few parashat ago at Parashat Bink, that Ahava mechalkeret et Ashura, which means the love is sometimes destroying the normal uh, order or, the, or destroying the rules. Usually a normal person will do. Love sometimes destroys this order because you love something so much that sometimes you do things who might be not the reasonable. And this is actually what Rabbi Zera did. He loved Eretz Israel so much, so he's, he's breaking the rules. And Moshe Rabbeinu, whole book of Devarim, he's trying to educate us to love Eretz Israel in this way that he will say, wow, we won't take it as granted, and we will think, every time we'll feel like how we got the, the right and the privilege to have it. And 
we will understand that it's not obvious. I would say it's, it's, it's relevant to many things, not just to love Eretz Israel, but many things in our life. The problem is that we're getting used to it and we're not appreciating it. And, uh, and I was in it and about um, uh, how to appreciate and how to say thank you and how is it important. We talk about the relationship between a husband and his wife. So in a way, it's the same story because when we have a relationship between a man and his wife and they are taking each other as obvious and they are not appreciating each other and they, of course she is watching her job or her role in the house and of course and at this point the love is damaged in a way the moment that you start taking your partner as something who is granted to you that moment things are start to break and in the case of Moshe, the fact that he's not entering to Art Israel, this is feeling that he appreciates Art Israel so much. And this is why when he's talking about Art Israel, it's, it's not possible that he wants to say in words all the time. And when he's talking, you will feel it all the time in his text. And there are parts in the book, in the book of the Bari, is that it's very obvious to see it. For example, in Parashat Ekev, so um, Moshe is saying, Hashem will bring you to a land flowing with uh, milk and honey, to a land with water uh, everywhere, and like all the great things. So in those, those parts, it's very, very clear that he's, he's trying to say that it's good. But there are other parts which is not that obvious that this is what he will try to say to us. And it's interesting that in those points when we're not expecting it, because this is a place where, it, where it's educating us the most. Because when you're not expecting to receive a certain message, and then it comes, you're much more open to hear it and to learn it. Um, so when we come to read this, um, this book, um, this, um, I would say, view of Moshe trying to teach us to, to can explain to us a few things who exist in this book. And also, um, so it will explain us the word Echa, which appears in our book, in the book of Zarim, and also appears in two other places in the prophets. And actually, it appears in the scroll of Echa that we're reading. Um, in Tish Abav. Um, we will start with the weird Tsukim. So I'm tapping here to the Devarim. And we'll understand again the message here. And from this, we'll try to understand also the Eicha message. So in the book of Devarim, the third chapter, um, Moshe is describing Mount Hermon. Um, let's see how he described it, and we'll read the commentators how they explain this um, explanation. So, uh, I'm reading the Hebrew. V'nikach ba'etahi et ha'aret mi'idei t'shnei malchei ha'emori asher be'ever ha'yerdem n'inachem ad har chermon. T'edonim ikreu l'chermon sirion, v'ha'emori ikreu l'chsmir. I'm reading the English. So we say, at that time, from the two Amorite kings, the country beyond them, from the Vadi Arnon to Mount Hermon, Sidonim, Sidonim, and the Amorites call it Snir. So we see here, he's describing how they capture this land, and then he puts a pasuk who explain us how different nations call the Mount of Hermon. So he said it's called Her Mountain of Hermon, but this nation called it Sirion, and it called it Snir. So why is it important for Moshe now to start telling us which different names as a nation have to this Nerat Israel to this mountain? I would say if we say every word in the Torah is important, every word has meaning, and the Torah doesn't write words like that, why is it important now to geographical or historical descriptions of the other nations? So, Rash, one explanation that might uh, give us light about this um, description. So, Rashi says, 
the Sidonis Kohermo, but it, in another passage it states, until Mount Sion, which is Hermon. So Rashi brings us another Pasuk, which, who comes a bit their other name. So we have already four different names for the Mount of Hermon. Hermon, Sirion, Smir, and Sion. So we see that in four names. Why was it necessary for all of them to be written in the scriptures? To extol the praise of the land of Israel, that there were four priding themselves in it, one saying, it shall be called by my name, and others saying, it shall be called by my name. So according to Rashi, he you know, there are four different nations fighting about how to call this mountain. And mountain, Mount Hermon is very nice or beautiful or special, but it's a, a, especially in the old times, it's, it's a very high mountain. It has snow on it. The, the land underneath is very, very hard. You can't grow there too much. Why? to fight on this part of the land and to fight on which name will it get. So, so it's weird in a way. And the fact that the other nations are fighting on it can teach us how important it is. So this can be one explanation. When Rashi, Rashi is actually saying when Moshe is giving us a different name, he wants to show us how the other nations like this place and how it's important for them. So from here you can learn how important it is. The, and the Hebrew is very long. I'll read you only the, the English version now. Um, you hear me now? I hope now the internet will be okay. So, oh, yes, um, yes, we hear you. Okay. okay, so this is what the Ramban is saying, Nachmanides. And it is possible that this praise will be so. But the great meaning of the text says that that night, the sons of the firstborn of Canaan will call Hermon Sirion, armor, when it was in their hands before. And the Amorites who dwell in it now call him Snir, which is snow in the language of Canaan, as Rashi explains. And because it is the mountain of snow, and because of the coolness, it will be Boikram. And this is why it's called Hermon, a per and perhaps also a, a tongue of armor in the language of the Sidon. So he's actually, the different names in the different nations have different meanings. One explanation can be, Sirion is an armor, and you can say maybe the Hermon has the armor on it, the snow who's covering it, and it looks like an armor. Another explanation, can be uh, from the word sneer, uh, that for me it was, and um, Rashi is right this word. For me, sneer is just a name for river in Israel. And I never thought it'd have a different meaning. And today I was reading Rashi, and his sneer come from the word schnee, from German, <laughs> um, snow in German. Um, so for me, it was very exciting to, to see. So yeah, uh, because it's covered with snow, they call it sneer. And another explanation is that Hermon, because it's cold and it's very, very hard to capture, why he will be boycott. No one will touch it. And this boycott means Herem in Hebrew. So this is Hermon. No one will touch this mountain. So he brings different perspectives, different ways to look at this mountain. And what Ramban is saying, you, if you can understand it in different ways, when Moshe about this mountain and start giving us the different names. He wants us to see that there are different perspectives to this mountain. It's not just a point on the map, a geographical location. For him, this mountain means something different. It's something who has more meaning. And I would say when you love something, you start talking about well, there is a person who might want talk too much, but the moment he starts talking about his kids, he starts telling him, yeah, and then he did this, and then he did this, because he loved them. When you feel attached to something and connect to something, then you start talking much more. And this is how Moshe is talking about the Israel. He's talking about the Hormon. He's feeling connected for him. This is so, wow, I would say, that he will, he will, he will start showing us a different perspective of him, of, of it. 
And I would say that in general in our life, when you look at things, you have two different ways to look. For example, our, our generation now, there are Jews living in Israel. We have a state, we have an army. There are people who were born in Israel to a family who, who many, many generations were praying to, to be in Israel. You can say it's amazing. 2,000 years we were waiting for it. This is such an amazing thing. But it's only if you're doing it from, um, I would say, zoom out. When you live now in Israel, very often where you drink Zoom in, when you're living in it, it's very, very easy to complain that it's so hot, that it's so risky, or that people are so rude, or that you sweat all the time. So many things and so many reasons to, to complain because you are inside the situation. And the ability to go a few steps back to do the Zoom out to see the, how amazing it is and how we should be grateful. This is what Moshe is trying to teach us. Again, he's saying, I, I want to be there. Not everyone has the right to, to experience those amazing things. I'm sure, if, again, if I will talk to the parents of my grandparents and tell them, you know, I was born in Israel for them, for me, this is something who is already obvious. And I'm not saying every day, oh, thank God I was born in Israel. When we're in the situation, we getting used to it and we complain instead of doing the zoom out and to see how amazing it is. And I would say this is why we even read of the Varim in the because you sit in Eretz Israel, you're sweating, you suffer, and this will come to tell you this is not obvious. Moshe is telling you, don't forget, this is not obvious, not every person to live in Eretz Israel. And now I want to jump to Eicha. If you have questions, just um, jump inside and in your microphone. And, and this is what um, Eicha is in Hebrew to take the word Eich and make it longer. Eich means how. And Eicha is like taking this how and make it like how. Just longer. You, you don't word, but the meaning is the same basically. So, what's the difference between saying eich to say echa? Um, one difference is that echa is a female way to say it, and eich is a masculine way. And we see that we have this word echa three times in the Bible. First time is in the book of Devarim. Um, which is actually in our, in our first chapter of the book that we're going to read this week. And we have two more times in the prophets, one in Yeshayahu, and one is in the book of Eicha that was written in Yermia. And I brought you the three different psukim, we will read them, and then we will read the Midrash from Eicha Rabbah, who explains us the difference between those three psukim. So the first Devarim, starting with the Hebrew, Eicha Esa Levadi, Torchachem Umaasachem Rivchem. How can I bear unaided the trouble of you, burden and the big? Now in Yeshayahu, Eicha Ezona, Kiriya Neemana, Mileti Mispat Tzedek Yalinda, Ve'atam Alas, she has become a harlot. She's talking about Eretz Yisrael. The, uh, the faithful city that had filled with justice, righteousness will, but now murderers. And now from Eicha, Eicha yashva badad ha'ir rabati am, ha'ita ke'almana rabati v'goyim, sarat ha'ita lamat. Alas, lonely sits the city, one of the people. She, she that was great among nations is become like a widow. The pre among states is become a third. So three psukim, and now um, let's see what uh, the midrash. How does she dwell? There are three who pro, uh, prophesy uh, with the language of a Moses, Yeshaya, yeah. Moses said, "How Echa will I carry alone?" Yeshaya said, "How Echa she has become a prophet." Mia said, how, Echa, does she dwell? 
Cedra de Levy. It is compared to a noble woman who had three friends. One saw her tranquility, one saw her in her recklessness, and one saw her in her So did Moses see Israel in their, and in their tranquility. And he said, how will I carry their burden along? Yeshaya saw them in the recklessness, and he said how she had become a prophet. Me saw them in degenerateness, and he said, how does she dwell? So, according to those three psukim, have different ways. Word of Eicha, Moshe saying he's not saying it in a negative way, but want to praise Am Israel. He says, how is it possible that I all of you on my back? Because not in the like that you're bad, but in the positive, Israel is so good, he's so great, that I alone is too small to actually eat them. So he's saying the way. And the, both, uh, the, the other psukim are actually talking in the way. There is a difference in the use of this word. But but kind difference from ech. I would say ech when you say how it's more like an intellectual question. So how it happened? You're thinking oh, it happened because of that. It happened because of this. You can understand in the different ways how something had happened. But Moshe Rabbeinu, when he's saying echa, he's not saying how did it happen that you're so amazing. He's saying it from how he's so fond of Israel. He loved them so much, and he, he's filled with this love. But when he's saying Eicha, he's again, it's not, it's not clear, it's so amazing. It's something very special, it's touching him. And when he's saying Eicha, he's saying it out of, how is it possible in an amazed way? And also when you say F, you say it with the closed mouth. And when you say Echa, you need to open your mouth. You're like, you're shocked out of it. Um, so also when we're going to Yeshayahu, what he's describing is a, a very bad situation. And he's saying maybe it was ra- people here were righteous and there was justice here, but now everyone um, and if when you're standing in the place of Yeshayahu, uh, of course, if you're saying, eh, how did it happen? Of course it happened, because all the people here are corrupted. Everyone are stealing and doing it. Of course, this is what will happen. This is when you say, eh, an intellectual question. But when you say, eh, ha, Yeshayahu, could, could you, you know, get used to it? Everyone, of course it happened. But for him, it's shocking him. He's not letting uh, the situation to be obvious for him. Of course, how could it happen? He's shocked from it. it he doesn't let it um, become something for him. He knows that I'm different, and he's not getting good to the bad situation. Same thing about Irmiyao. He said, how is it possible in, in this case Oh, it, it can happen because I'm as well did since. Of course it happened. No, this is how could it happen? This situation is getting him and shocking him. So I would say the message from Moshe and from, from this Eicha, from this question is we should build in ourselves this level, not taking things as granted and not taking things as obvious. It's, it's coming for the good and for the bad. When you have great things around us, we should do them and stop appreciating them. We should keep saying Eicha in, in this, my, how is it possible that I received all this goodness? How is it possible that my life, that I have so many amazing things around me, that I have a family or that I have friends or that I have my job that I love or we, we need to all the time, not to get you to have those good things, but all the time to say Eicha. Thank you, Hashem, and to be uh, able to appreciate it. But also to the bad. When we have bad things around us, when we become bad, then people behave in a wrong way, even ourselves. We shouldn't get used to it. 
and to say, yes, this is how things are. We should also, we're not getting used to it. It's, it's touching us. And I would say that if we're going back to the good thing, the same way that Moshe is looking at the Mount of Hermon and he's searching more and more perspective in it and more and more ways to see it in a good way, we should try a good perspective. And if we have something good in, um, for example, in our uh, friend, so we need to search all the time effective to see how he's good for us and how we are blessed to have him it's not just because he's a good listener but to see another another good things in him all the time and i want to connect it to we started with the fact that aaron passed away at birth of Av, which is, um was yesterday actually and he did it again to aaron because the way that Moshe is looking at, uh, in, a, in a way, the way that Aaron is looking at Am Israel, um, we talked about it a few weeks ago, that Aaron, he, he looked at all of Am Israel and he could see the good in them, he could see the potential, and he could see a different perspective in them that the, the people, People might even see when again we talked about the fact that the person who sinned came to the temple and he needed to 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 talk about his sins and what are the bad things that he did. Those people usually feel so bad about them themselves. And when the priests say one person after another who, who do all those things, he say, Oh, of Amisrael are so horrible, they do all those bad things. But we said that the priest, the Kohen. He had the ability to still see the good and still have the hope and not to give those things, but to actually believe in those people and to see the other perspective of them. And this is how the, the fact that the priest meets the person, the, the person who sinned can brood from, from the person who sinned. And in a way, this is how Moshe is looking at Israel. This is how Aaron is looking at the army around him. And this is maybe how... Um, David in uh, Tehillim is doing a beautiful connection between Moshe, Aharon, and the monk. And I want us to read this psalm together and to see how, how it goes very nicely together. Um, so I'll read the Hebrew and then the English. Shira ma'alot le David. Hine matov umanaim shevet achim gam yachad. Kashemel hatov al harosh, yored al azakan. Skan Aharon sheyored al tim. כתל חרמון שיורד על הררי ציון, כי שם ציווה השם את הברכה, חיים עד העולם. like the dual moon that falls on the mountain. There the Lord ordained blessing, everlasting life. So maybe this is how um, David is connecting all those three um, different cards and also what his mountain is doing here. Because I think that from this perspective, this is it should bring us blessing and life to, to us. And I really wish to all of you to be able uh, to see in your life um, the blessing and not to get used to it, because it's very, very easy um, to forget how special all the things around us and how they are not. And I guess at this year, at this week especially, when there were so many disasters, wish on the beauty found us and not to get used to them and to appreciate them and thank you very much for joining me today um, this is our last meeting for this um, girls learning together until September at least so thank you very much for learning with me um, if you have questions free and uh, yeah thank you for learning with thank me. you Rotem. thank you
Wow, until and, September? Uh, wow. What? Until September, right? Yeah. Enjoy the okay. summer. <laughs> Enjoy the heat in Israel. Thank you. Soon you'll join me too. You too. Praise God. Yes, um, that's my session. Thank you, Ratam. That was awesome. That was really very special to learn with you. Thank you to all the girls that were learning together. Have a great summer. Stay cool and enjoy your vacation. And see you in Israel or see you here in a few months. Be well. Yeah. Thank all you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.